Welcome back, honored guest, to St. Trina's Lore Alert. There is much to discuss, so let's get straight into today's lesson. This series will explore everything there is to know about our channel's namesake, St. Trina. However, to fully understand the minute details associated with her character, we must first explore some of the game's most pervasive yet obscure symbols. Those are the Third Eye and the Whirlpool. I believe these two symbols represent two cosmic meridians, for lack of a better word. Each one has their own story to tell, but what connects them is nothing short of godhood itself. Naturally, that means today is going to be quite a deep dive. For now though, welcome to Lore Alert 05. Saint Trina exposed herself? Wee woo, wee woo. This is a lore alert. Please remain seated while we discover this lore. Let's begin with the whirlpool image and work our way back to the third eye and St. Trina herself. Simply put, the whirlpool represents the hand of time. It churns the lands between and makes life progress towards death and then rebirth with each new dawn. If you need confirmation, you need only to open your map and look in the lower right. There you will find your time of day dial spinning. In its very center is our first symbol, steadily moving the lands depicted and the heavens that encompass them. Deep lore nerds may already know that with the help of research from Quelag and the Ashen Scholar, I developed one of my most unhinged lore documents, Elden Pangea, which is linked below. I don't want to spoil the entire document, so I will simply state that I believe this particular whirlpool to represent Ferrum Azula and the giant storm at its center. Furthermore, I believe the city's original placement to be in the center of the lands between. Each region of the lands between is color coded to match up with the colors of the time of day. And that fact alone can tell us a lot about the author's original intentions with the motif. Even if you do not subscribe to the basic idea that the lands between were once arranged differently. Faramazula is said to be removed from time. And I believe it is because it was the celestial body that used to churn time itself in the lands between. You can even see a whirlpool still underneath Ferrum Azula on the actual map itself. Our central character, Merica, is afraid of death. And one logical way to thwart death is to remove the deity and storm that moves time forward. However, one example does not a pattern make. Let's examine other examples of this symbol in game. My favorite example of the use of spirals helps to highlight the alchemical concept of a macrocosm within a microcosm. If the spiral represents time, its counterpart would be the crystal which represents space, as in the one you need spaceships to reach. This is a new symbol, but we only need to analyze it for this section, so bear with me. In a modern literary setting, the concept of macrocosm-microcosm relationship could be expressed by the multitude of subatomic particles that make up the visible universe. This sub-universe, so to speak, is completely unseen to our eyes, yet it determines how all interactions between particles work. Some artists draw parallels between the subatomic world and the macro world of the Big Bang and solar systems. Imagining atoms as small solar systems unto themselves is a common way for a modern author to express this concept. And I'm making a very clear distinction between the ancient understanding of this concept and the modern one. Elden Ring is using a medieval backdrop, but I believe it is combining modern 
and ancient takes on this concept simultaneously. This is why we see the most mysterious form of magic reference deep space and gravity. Just take a look at all of the pictures in this section for examples of when space, crystal magic, and gravity are referenced alongside each other. Most of these examples come paired with a black dot of some sort, which I interpret as a black hole, especially in the case of gravity spells. Torrent's name, association with Lyernia, and the fact that he rides a spiral spirit spring also reinforce this connection. Finally, our most pivotal character, Melina, also has the spiral hidden in her design. Look very closely at her eye during the Frenzied Flame ending. You will see that she has an extremely hidden swirl and black dot design in her non-blind eye. Many thanks to Zlovsky, because without their extremely high-res photos, we would not have uncovered this detail. Gravity and time are intertwined in our modern conception of the forces of nature, yet we cannot fully control either force yet. By showing the black hole symbol and the symbol for time together so often, not only does it look badass, but it also is hinting at what questions are at play in this narrative. Mastering gravity means mastering space-time itself. Some would even call it divine knowledge we are seeking. Another way to understand this style of writing is to consider that the physics of today is a continuation of the spiritual questions asked by some of the first humans to have conscious thought. Religiously informed alchemists and philosophers at large in the Middle Ages have claimed that the microcosm within the human soul either contains or reflects the entire cosmos. It is extremely well written, then, that Selen's quest reveals that sorcerers can store their souls within crystals. My apprentice, thank you for coming. These shackles take a toll on us all. There is something I need you to look after. My primal glinstone. A star has fallen and my fortunes waver. Someone may come for my life. And so, I entrust it with you. Myself. Let's consider that crystal magic is the magic of the cosmos. Then, a sorcerer storing their soul inside of a crystal is like saying to the reader, I am one with the stars, which is both beautiful and technically true in the case of us humans. Let us not forget that the carbon that runs all organic life was created by fusion reactions generated by stars themselves. I believe by blending these concepts, Miyazaki is creating a lexicon for us to engage with questions that have largely faded out of popular conversation, such as, but not limited to, what is the nature of the human soul and what is the nature of God and the cosmos? To rephrase, we all came from stars, takes an extremely literal interpretation during this quest line. Allow me to close this section with a quote that probably wasn't actually written by the fabled Hermes Trismegistus, the most famous alchemist of all. As above, so below. As within, 
so without. As the universe, so the soul. Jumping over to the macro side of things, trying to conceptualize massive systems such as the Big Bang, jet galactic superclusters, or God itself onto literary story elements can be very challenging. One of the best ways our measly mortal brains can do this is by personifying these cosmic entities. Alchemists and theologians have done this in their time, and physicists and sci-fi writers do the same today. Once again, I believe Miyazaki wants to highlight the similarities between these two ways of understanding the cosmos, however removed from one another they may be in the timeline of human existence. Compare, for example, this galactic entity to the Elden Beast. Lanakia is the galactic supercluster where our measly galaxy resides. And it is very logical to interpret this as a deity in some ways. It may be a collection of stars billions of light years long, yet it binds us to essentially everything we see in the night sky. It sounds pretty godlike to me. Predictably, the binding force of the Lanakia is gravity. To my eyes, this supercluster, as well as the Elden Beast, appear like some sort of deep sea creature, elegantly flowing through the waters that is space. The Elden Beast, much like its other suspected influence, the dear god of Princess Mononoke, contains elements of several animals. Notably, they both contain hints of human features as well. The human-like arms and eyes of the deer god likely represent a similar concept to the hands and feet of the Elden Ring. They hint at a deity's direct connection to the human race, or perhaps their ascendance above human intelligence. In the case of Elden Ring, let us not forget that the greater will granted the beasts their intelligence, and with it, their fifth finger. The fifth finger on the human body, the thumb, is often thought of as the appendage that separates us, quote unquote, from the beasts, because it allows us to create much more complex tools than ever possible with paws, for example. For more on every finger in Elden Ring, consider my collaboration with Sophie of Sinclair Lore, which will also be linked below. I say all of this to point out that the Elden Ring and the beasts who reside within Radagon are the ultimate example of a macrocosm existing within a microcosm. The Elden Beast is simply put, everything. Or more generally, the Elden Beast is capital G, God. Yet, it lives within the soul of this one being. Both of these scenes deal directly with macrocosms within microcosms, and they reveal the dualistic nature of the soul versus the body in Elden Ring. The Elden Ring essentially plays the role of Radagon's soul, the same way that Selen's glintstone is, as she puts it. I entrust it with you, myself. This is my essence. Please treat it with care. The difference here is that the Elden Ring is closer to the soul of the entire universe rather than the soul of this one individual. Just as the Elden Beast mimics a supercluster of galaxies, I believe the whirlpool symbol of Elden Ring is inspired, at least partially, by the Milky Way itself. And we will discuss what that possibility means at length in the next section. The Milky Way is a binding force holding our solar system in step with the other stars in our night sky, if it were to be removed from our cosmology, life as we know it would be thrown into chaos. 
I believe that is what has happened with the removal of Faramazula from the cosmology of Elden Ring. We can even see a diagram of this previous cosmology on the blue cloth set. Here you see Destined Death seated at the heart of a great storm, with Siofra and Ainsel rivers on either side. I believe this too depicts Faramazula, and perhaps the great bridge that once connected all of the lands. As a reminder, the incantation, Blessing of the Erdtree, the Talisman, Erdtree's Favor, the key item, Golden Seed, and the original cinematic trailer all mention the Erdtree as a vital part of life flourishing in the lands between. More specifically, it draws a direct line between the womb of Merica and the bounteous seeds and sap that the tree produces. A particular design keeps me up at night in this regard. It is the tree motif stitched into Melania's cape. In it, we can find the Halig tree, but within the tree's boughs lie seeds that look extremely familiar. Indeed, these seeds have the exact same spiral to the one used to represent time and likely Faramazula. I believe this to be the game's most poetic expression of the alchemical macrocosm within the microcosm that we have explored so much already. If an Erd tree and a storm are central parts of the cosmology of the world of Elden Ring, I believe these seeds to be representative of potential new worlds that could be formed from the Halig Tree's bounty. A seed which provides everything a new life needs to develop is a logical choice when discussing microcosm versus macrocosms. It is also used by modern day writers to parallel the solar system. A godly tree such as the Halig Tree should logically carry seeds with the powers of the gods themselves, that of time and space, as well as, of course, giving life. One of my favorite examples of the analogous nature of the gods and cosmic entities is the Fel God, who resides within the fire giant. The third eye of this deity has a famous storm that actually resides in Jupiter's North Pole. Both user Legendary Jake on Reddit and sister channel Quaylag have pointed out that this storm is essentially one to one with the Fel God's third eye. Links below as always. The third eye, as we will discuss shortly, represents divine knowledge. During our brainstorming, channel friend Nipresu said of the symbol, I read the use of the storm as an instance of repeating motif in Elden Ring, order emerging out of mass chaos. I found this description apt because the monumental outer vortexes of Jupiter's North Pole are held in place by the even more colossal storm at its center. Because of that, we say it has eight plus one storms in the system because the one is holding the system together. Numerology in Elden Ring is not reliable at all, unfortunately. However, eight outer storms and one inner storm may hold some significance. It certainly denotes the fell God's status as a true God of chaos, but there is another character whose third eye is also in an 8 plus 1 formation. Her name is Saint Trina, and I believe she holds the answer to why 8 plus 1 is important, beyond the fact that it is badass that Jupiter was able to sustain that many cyclones. By the way, 8 plus 1 
is actually the record that Jupiter has ever gotten to in terms of how many storms were maintained simultaneously. At long last, St. Trina's torch. She's a beauty, isn't she? This one item has everything we need to enlighten ourselves about this elusive character. Naturally, the flame produced is purple, and the effect causes sleep buildup. We won't linger here, as that angle has been thoroughly explored in previous lore alerts. However, there is a clue nearby that strengthens the connections I began laying out in our episode on bells. Note that the top of the torch has a candle wick rather than the traditional larger wicks of the other torches. This design choice, using a candle wick specifically, is a direct continuation of the motifs we discussed in that episode. The candle alongside the bell is a central symbol in the Souls series for communion with the realm of death and dreams. In that video, we look at the connections across the entire soul series. In particular, remember that in Dark and Demon Souls, the candle represents the candle maidens, who are often blind. In Elden Ring, it represents spirit tuning and guiding spirits. In all cases, this symbolic lexicon is associated with care and emotional connection. The Grave Glove Wart description describes spirit tuning in a very attentive and personal way. Something between tuning an instrument and conducting a conversation. It is fair to say the motifs of the Candle Maiden slash Firekeeper are echoed in the Finger Maidens as well. But take a look at these two rare gestures from my favorite spirit tuner, Rodrika. I believe that both of these gestures pay homage to the opening sequence of Dark Souls 1, wherein the Firekeeper gently catches a spark and uses it to revive the player character. From an interview, we learned that Miyazaki was extremely fond of this scene, even having them redo it a few times to get the emotions right. It is nice to see this gentle gesture be reborn in such a complex character, and one day I will do a deep dive on her as well. All of that preamble is to say that Putting a candle wick on top of St. Trina's torch is a very deliberate choice. This is a signal to us that Trina is a spirit tuner, which I have asserted in the past. We do not have much personification of St. Trina, so we cannot say for sure that she is a comforting or even benevolent character. However, the cut content suggests that she held the madness at bay that haunts the wandering merchants using her song. Links below to Sekiro Dewey's restoration of that quest. There is a ton to explore in that regard, so I highly recommend you watch the episode on bells, candles, sleep, and death if you have not already. With the candle wick out of the way, Let's move on to make a full analysis of the relief depicted on the front of the torch. Predictably, her eyes are blinded by her hair. However, her third eye can still see. The third eye chakra in Hinduism is associated with Lord Shiva. Opening one's inner eye is how one's, one achieves higher planes of consciousness and enlightenment. Similar concepts exist in Buddhism, but I would like to focus on the Hindu eye for the sake of simplicity and because of my theories surrounding Rani that I will explain as a bonus at the end. The third eye in Elden Ring 
has its own meaning beyond the religious references, however. In my opinion, it is what denotes a true god. I believe this because of the personification of the fell god in the incantations Flame of the Fell God and Catch Flame. In Catch Flame, we discovered that the Flame of Ruin is anathema to the Erd Tree, meaning it acts as a curse to the Erd Tree. That puts the Fell God squarely on the level of the Elden Beast. An equally valid interpretation is that this third eye denotes the three fingers and chaos because the flame of ruin is so heavily associated with chaos, and generally anything Merica is afraid of. We don't have time to fully explore this angle either, but it does bear noting that St. Trina being associated with sleep, and therefore death, is most likely also threatening to Merica, the same way the Glomide Queen was. With so much learning in this episode, the last stretch is relatively easy to follow, but it's also unhinged. Essentially, I think the land octopi in game are symbols of St. Trina. Their placement, color scheme of blue and purple, as well as the connections that we will delve into in just a moment are how I reached this conclusion. Land octopi live in quite a few locations, but they are especially abundant near Saints Bridge and the hidden path to the Hallig Tree. These are all tangentially related to St. Trina, the latter of which is a path leading us to the Albanorx and Wolf Riding Archers. Remember that we already analyzed the Wolf Riders in the last episode and discovered that they drop St. Trina's arrows. Furthermore, the octopi themselves are writhing and contorting, evoking a similar chaotic power that is directly connected to the sea and thus space and sleep. Even a standard octopus helps us to solidify this motif. Take a look at an octopus upside down. Its mouth is the plus one in eight plus one. This part is admittedly a stretch, but their mouths even seem black hole coded to me, as the tentacles all converge on that one point. With so many chaotic symbols, it is fair to say that the eight swirls of hair plus one third eye in the torch's relief present Saint Trina to us as a chaotic figure in the eyes of the Golden Order. The swirls themselves mirror the chaotic storms in the fire giant's third eye. The octopus's writhing design hints at chaos and death themes, but they also bear striking symbols associated with the godskins as well. Saint Trina is a goddess of sleep, and the Glomide Queen is the queen of death. So it comes as no surprise that her attendants the Godskin nobles share some design elements and color schemes with St. Trina. However, a queen in Elden Ring is a motherly title. Just look at Merica and Renala for your evidence there. Yet again, St. Trina's octopi shine a light on this motif. As I mentioned in the past, I can't put my official lore seal of approval on St. Trina being the Glomide Queen directly, but we do see their symbolic language mixing often. I leave you with these two details to ponder. Why do the larger octopi have eggs all over their bodies? And why do they need human blood to power their ovaries? Thematically, it reminds me a lot of the themes present in the Godskins and especially the Godskin Swaddling Cloth. A swaddling cloth, of course, being a garment specifically designed to carry a child. I promised a bonus round, so here it is.
We have two loose ends to tie up quickly before we conclude our lesson. First, why do I lean on Hinduism in my interpretation of the third eye? Many of Elden Ring's games feature references to Samsara. Rebirth happens a lot to the player character, so it is natural to include this in your thesis. That is why I believe Rani's name and design are modeled partially after Shiva, or better yet, Shakti from the Hindu faith. Though we do not know the original reason, Shiva is often depicted in ancient Indian paintings as having blue skin. He slash she also have four arms, just like Rani. Finally, the name Rani in Sanskrit means princess, precisely the language of the Hindu faith and precisely the role that Rani plays in our narrative. Because of this game's obsession with the rebirth cycle, even more than usual, I find it very poetic to have your faction associated with night and the moon and death to also be the one carrying some sneaky Hindu imagery. Remember that Renala is also obsessed with rebirth. Furthermore, she has black hair that we do not see under her crown. I believe this is a deliberate choice to hide the fact that her hair is normally very wild, just like Ronnie's doll form. However, we know almost for a fact that Renala is not the Glomide Queen. Double, however, I do have a guess. The Twin Bird Kite Shield is going to be my guide for this final hot take. The description reads, Shield featuring a vividly painted Twin Bird. The Twin Bird is said to be the envoy of an outer god and mother of the Deathbirds. The Glomide Queen is Merica's opposing twin character. So when looking for her, we should search for a motherly character who is moon associated. She would have some other polar opposite features, I think, as well. With all that being said, please hold my beer. My official lore, hashtag lore alert prediction for the identity of the original Glomide Queen is this unnamed character from the DLC trailer. She has black hair that is very wild. Her husband is the polar opposite of Godfrey and her weird hair danglies look suspiciously similar to the God Slayer's greatsword, which was the sword of the Glomide Queen specifically. However, most importantly of all to our conversation, she is holding her stomach, indicating that she is likely pregnant and an important mother figure, just like the land octopi, just like Merica, and certainly just like the Glomide Queen. Remember that Liernia draws on the legacy of Velka, the black-haired crow goddess of sin from the Dark Souls series. She has the signature wild untamed hair, but also look at the way her eyes are obscured. Being a blind maiden is almost always used to indicate a holy character. Think to all the bonfire maidens and, ma and the maiden in black from Demon Souls. One final note for everyone to ponder. The swirls present in St. Trina's torch are also present in the gloam-eyed queen's greatsword. Coincidence? <laughs> Thank you so much for everyone that made it this far in the video. You all are absolute G's. Uh, I have a game that I'm developing with my life partner, Hyacinth. We are going to try and release the alpha this year. So with that being said, I'm going to be very MIA coming up. I'm trying to do a bunch of DLC predictions, lay out my, uh, my thoughts, 
uh, to give you guys something to to ponder over until it comes out. But uh, coming up, I'm going to be very, very busy trying to get this game done. So if I don't see you between now and then, ciao. And uh, I hope the DLC is as good as it seems like it's going to be. Bye-bye. Credits, credits, credits. Screenshots and clips were by me and one from DBits. Renders were also provided by Zlovsky. Special thanks to Zlovsky, Hyacinth, Debists, Sinclair Lore, Sophie, Quaylag, The Ashen Scholar, Nipresu, The McFrenzy, Preaker Eyes, Ocean, Luna, Zan, Kick Six, and everybody else who helped live. I pray I didn't forget too many names. Thank you all so much. My work would be half as good without the incredible minds around me helping me to develop my ideas over time. Thank you all. Have a great day.